Hello again. So here we're going to talk about HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, and this is kind of a new thing that's uh, going on in uh, recent medical history. Uh, in the last five or six years, it's really starting to catch on, and this is really good for we're trying to prevent the spread of HIV. Uh, because we don't have a cure yet, so the idea is we're trying to prevent the spread of HIV. And you're going to have patients come in asking you about this, and so you'll want to know about it. As far as the USMLE goes, I wouldn't put it outside the realm of possibility they may ask about this. So it's, uh, it's good to know, but particularly for clinical practice. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click the link below in the description of the video or on the I button up here on the upper right hand corner and it should link you up. If you consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over case studies, forming a differential diagnosis and treatment plan, and that should come in useful for you both for clinical practice and for step three of the USMLE, which has a portion of it that's not multiple choice, and you'll need to know how to approach patients and get a treatment plan, differential, and all that stuff. So thank you very much in advance for your support. So we're going to talk about the background behind pre-exposure prophylaxis, how effective it is, why we do it. We'll talk about pre-treatment counseling and work up a very important part of pre-exposure prophylaxis. You need to figure out who this patient is, why they need it, if they're a candidate or not, and do some counseling. And then we'll talk about the treatment, the specifics of pre-exposure prophylaxis, the kind of drug it is, We'll talk about the follow-up, another very important part of the treatment for these patients because we know that anybody who's asking for this is probably putting themselves in risky situations, so we always want to follow up with them, and then we'll recap things. This should be a relatively short lecture. I highly encourage you to watch my comprehensive HIV lecture first before watching this because I'm going to assume you have some background knowledge on HIV treatment. So this is the transmission modes in, uh, of HIV in the United States. I talk about this in the HIV talk. Uh, as you can see, in the U.S., the plurality of cases are spread by men who have sex with men, not because being gay is a bad thing, but because men spread STDs much more easily than women. I mean, think about how STDs are spread through bodily fluids, and men have one extra bodily fluid that women don't have, and that is semen, and semen is loaded with HIV. So uh, you have one man spreading it to another man who can spread it to another man can, who can spread it to another man, whereas with heterosexuals, well, a man can spread it to a woman really easily, and especially the vaginal tissue very easily can sop up that HIV. But a woman can't spread it to a man in the same way. And so it's kind of a one-way street for heterosexuals. So it's not that heterosexuals are somehow cleaner than men who have sex with men. It's just men spread it more easily either to women or to one another than women can spread it. IV drug use, big problem. Now, you see more men who have sex with men spreading it, but that's because there's a lot more men having sex with men than there are IV drug users. People who use IV drugs, though, are putting themselves in an extremely precarious situation because what's the... What's the bodily fluid that has the most HIV? It's the blood. And if you're, if you're sharing needles and you've got a, somebody over there who's got HIV and now you just use their needle, you just took some of their blood and put it into yourself. And you don't need a whole lot of HIV to seroconvert. So this is the most risky thing you can do. Worldwide, it's actually heterosexual sex that is the most uh, common way that it's spread. And that's probably because worldwide there's a lot more heterosexual males who have HIV because they got it from their mother, from a, a vertical transmission. And a lot of that is in the developing world, where we don't have really good uh, prenatal care and all the things that prevent, uh, prevent vertical transmission. So I talk about that more in the HIV talk. So the background of PrEP. So we know that up to 2 million new HIV infections occur annually worldwide. For uninfected patients, PrEP is a really good FDA-approved evidence-based means to prevent new infections among those at greatest risk. And as a matter of fact, the medication we use for PrEP, tenofovir and tricitabine, both NRTIs, uh, this is a medication called Truvada. It's FDA-approved. It's been around for a few years now. When it's taken as recommended daily, it reduces the risk of HIV transmission by up to 90%. That is incredible. And so... Patients who are on this, they're doing themselves a great favor. 
That being said, there's some things we need to tell these patients, and we'll get into that. For maximal efficacy, strict adherence is necessary. They need to take this every day. And these medications may have some side effects, so this isn't some, you know, this isn't some benign little thing that they're doing. They're taking a kind of a, a big medication here. It's not like taking a Tylenol. The adverse effect potential for PrEP is not negligible. Therefore, a history and baseline screening and workup are necessary before starting treatment. And so, what is that? So, you need to get, if a patient comes in and they say, I'm interested in PrEP, you want to get a detailed history and workup before you start it. You don't just give them PrEP. This is not some over-the-counter thing. You don't do that. You need to get a good history on them and a workup. You're actually going to have to draw labs before you can get, give them PrEP. So, there, uh, you want to get a sexual history. You want to know, and this is just your basics of your sexual history that you learn when you start med school. So you want to know, are they having sex with men? Are they having sex with women or both? What are their sexual practices? Are they having oral sex? Are they having vaginal sex? Are they having anal sex? Some of these patients will come to you asking for PrEP because they just got into a relationship with somebody who has HIV. And we call that a serodiscordant relationship. And what that person wants to do, rightly, is they want to try to prevent themselves of getting the HIV from their partner. So you want to know that if, do they have any partners, regular partners, who have HIV? That's a big indication for PrEP. How about their number of partners? Are they having sex with one person and one person alone? Or are they having sex with strangers two or three different times a week? What about their STD history? That tells you a lot about their sort of behavior, uh, you know, their, their predilections. You know, is this a promiscuous person maybe, or is this, you know, a well-behaved person who likes to have a little fun every now and then? Uh, so those are some things you'll want to know. Uh, and then you want to know their drug use behavior. So aside from sex, what's the other thing that causes you to get HIV? Shared drug, shared needles. So you want to know what kind of recreational drugs do they use. If they smoke weed every now and then, they're not at risk for HIV. But if they're shooting up heroin and using shared needles, that's a problem. Uh, and so you want to know about shared needles or equipment. Injection in a shooting gallery. Until I read up on this uh, a year or two ago, I didn't know what a shooting gallery is. But apparently it's like some place that like somebody sets up and has all the, the equipment there, like your needles and everything. Since you didn't buy that needle, you didn't like order it brand new, you don't know where that's been, so that's a risk factor. And then the use of non-parenteral drugs that decrease condom use. So that's something like uh, you they're using, they go to a bar, they have alcohol, and when they uh, t drink alcohol and they don't think of using a condom, then they don't use it. Maybe when they're sober, they would use a condom, but when they're drunk, they don't. Uh, so that's something that's useful for you to know. So the pretreatment workup should include an HIV test for a very important reason, which we'll talk about. So that's your fourth generation antigen antibody immunoassay. You want to test them for hepatitis B. And again, this will make sense as we talk about this. For women, you want to get a pregnancy test because if they have HIV and they're pregnant, then you want to know uh, because our treatment is going to differ. And if they're just pregnant alone, these drugs, particularly tenofovir, uh, can it has been associated with some birth issues and also with pregnancy loss. And then you want to get a serum creatinine level because tenofovir can cause issues with the kidney, so you want to know that. These four things you want at the very least. You may actually, depending on their history, you may test them for other STDs if they volunteer a history that's consistent with the possibility of having other STDs or they're putting themselves into that situation. Uh, but th this is your basic workup. So some considerations. HIV positive patients can't receive PrEP. So aside from the fact that why would an HIV positive person want or need to be on PrEP anyway because this is to prevent getting HIV, but the important thing about this is that if you have a patient maybe that doesn't know they have HIV but they do have it and then you give them PrEP, what is PrEP? It's tenofovir and tricitabine. That's just two NRTIs. Is that sufficient treatment for HIV? Absolutely not. And if they're, they're supposed to be on two NRTIs and then one drug of another class. And if they're only on two NRTIs, they can easily, that HIV that's in them can easily become resistant to both tenofovir and emtricitabine. And now you've just knocked out two drugs that you cannot give them anymore. 
Okay, so you want to make sure that they don't have HIV before you give them PrEP. Patients who have a GFR of less than 60, they really should not get PrEP. And this is a, according to the Infectious Disease Society of America. So they can't get PrEP because tenofovir is bad for your kidneys. And if their kidneys are already struggling, then you really just don't want to put them on that drug. Hepatitis B patients who have hepatitis B, and this is why you get the HBV panel, they can get PrEP, but they need to be aware that if they discontinue the drug that they're on, it could result in acute hepatitis flare. Why? Because tenofovir is actually first-line treatment for chronic hepatitis B. So if they're taking tenofovir, which is good, if you know they need treatment for their hepatitis B, tenofovir is a great drug, and you can actually kill two birds with one stone by having them on tenofovir with entrocytabine. If they take that, but then they stop it, then their hepatitis could flare up. So unlike people who don't have hepatitis, they can stop it, and that's not a big deal. But if they have hepatitis B, and they take PrEP, they take tenofovir, and then they stop it, and that's a problem. So those patients, if they decide to go on PrEP and they have Hep B, they need to stay on it. They can't just go off it. Now, you may use PrEP in pregnancy, but the data surrounding the risks is limited, so you need to educate these women on that there are possible risks with tenofovir. It is possible this has been associated with fetal bone issues, with pregnancy loss, so they need to be aware of that before they start. But it is okay. You can give them PrEP. Uh, they just need to be made aware of the, the possible things that can go wrong. Breastfeeding is not a contraindication for PrEP, so they can be on their PrEP and breastfeed. That is okay. Patients may not volunteer the risk factors for HIV. Very, very, very important. Please, please, please bear this in mind. You may have a patient who comes to you and they deny everything. So are you, having, are you a man who has sex with men? A lot of guys, especially young guys, are not going to admit to that. Or maybe it's a married guy. Uh, who, you know, married to a woman, who doesn't want to admit to that because there's some shame still, unfortunately, stigma with being gay. And so some patients may not tell you that. Or drug use. They don't want to tell you about their drug use because they're afraid you're going to judge them. But they, if they come to you asking for PrEP, they probably have a good reason, even if they don't tell you. So keep that in mind. And even if the patient doesn't tell you their risky situation they're in, that's not doesn't make it okay for you to assume that they're not in a risky situation. Okay, so in my opinion, you should work a patient up and and uh, and consider prep for anybody who asks it, even if they don't volunteer uh, the risky situation that they're in. So who's a candidate? This just kind of reiterates things. HIV negative patients in a sexually active serodiscordant relationship, very much so. You want them on prep. Men who have sex with men and transgender women who are, uh, you know, anatomically, usually anatomically males, genetically males. Uh, so if they fit these criteria, but like I said, if they come asking for PrEP, you should give it to them. And then anyone who's injected illicit drugs in the last six months, shared recreational drugs, blah, 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 blah. But what it all boils down to is if they're in a risky situation or if they ask for PrEP, give them PrEP. If, if they fit, if they, you know, there's no contraindications for PrEP, like they're HIV positive or they have bad kidney function. So who's not a candidate? Maybe it's just easier to remember this. Who's not a candidate? If they have HIV or if they have poor kidney function. That is why we get an HIV test and a creatinine level. So the treatment, what PrEP is, is tenofovir and tricitabine. It's marketed as Truvada. It's 300 milligrams of tenofovir, 200 milligrams of tricitabine. It's taken orally once a day. The adverse effects, lactic acidosis. All NRTIs can cause lactic acidosis. Tenofovir can cause renal toxicity. It can be frank acute renal failure, or it can be something like Fanconi syndrome, where you're peeing out things you're not supposed to be doing. Uh, then uh, hepatomegaly and steatosis, this is relatively rare, but they can go into uh, liver failure issues. They get jaundice and all that stuff, so you want to keep an eye out for that. Maybe educate them. If you start turning yellow, come into the ER. A bone mineral density loss. You don't really need to worry about this on most patients you're going to be prescribing PrEP to, but if they have any kind of history of easy bone breaks, if they're older women maybe, then you might want to get a DEXA scan, but there's really nothing you, you really do routinely to, uh, to work them up for this. But it should be kept in mind that the longer you're on PrEP, the worse your bone mineral density can get. 
And then GI upset. This is really minor. This is like flatulence, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. This tends to resolve with continued use. Usually it's something that's really only bad for the first couple weeks, if at all. Please use in caution in patients who have risk factors for renal disease, even if their creatinine clearance comes back normal. If they have risk factors for renal disease, you've got to keep a close eye on these patients. So this would be patients who are diabetic, with chronic hypertension, older patients. Some important information for counseling that you want to tell these patients. The drug takes several days to weeks to achieve optimal serum concentration. So even though you might go on someday and not use condoms, you need to be using condoms at least for the first couple weeks. For anal intercourse, because the, the anal mucosa is a little bit sturdier and because it, it uh, gets the, the Truvada concentration, I think, goes up faster in that mucosa, uh, that uh, you can start not using condoms in, uh, I hate to say that, uh, in a shorter period of time, so seven days. Vaginal intercourse, 21 days. So ideally, though, this is important, and I... I hate saying this up here, uh, but ideally, PrEP should be an additional safeguard. They should continue. You never tell a patient, oh, stop using a condom. You never tell a patient that. Safe sex is always the best way to go if you're putting yourself in a risky situation. If you're married, maybe you can stop. But uh, this should be an additional safeguard to, to uh, safe sex, to condom use. And then also educate the patient about symptoms of acute HIV infection. You know, you get sick, you feel gross, you get swollen lymph nodes, you have night sweats, you have fever, and lactic acidosis. Uh, tenofovir, okay, so this tenofovir, it's more properly referred to as tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate. This is a particular kind of tenofovir. Uh, and it's different from tenofovir alafenamide, which you don't need to know this. But if you type in tenofovir on, uh, on your medical database, uh, if you're trying to prescribe this, it may give you both of them. And so it might be useful for you to know there. But I would just, if you're in the U.S. and you have your EMR and you're typing in for a prescription, just type in Truvada. It'll give it to you. It'll give you the right dose and everything. So what do we do to follow these patients up? So all patients should be seen... A month after initiation, so when you start the drug, they come back in in a month. You want to make sure they're not having any acute side effects. And they're, they're whatever nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, flatulence, whatever they had GI-wise, that that's starting to go away. Then you'll see them again in, after three months. So two months later, you'll see them again. And at that point, then, you will monitor their adherence, ask about side effects. You're going to screen them again for HIV. You'll get a routine screening for STDs regardless of symptoms. So this is going to be things like uh, NAAT for chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, IgG, uh, hepatitis C. Uh, you'll test for that. And then uh, pregnancy tests for women. And then a serum creatinine should be done for patients who have risk factors for renal disease. And you'll see these patients every three months. So you're only going to ever write out a prescription for Truvada for three months worth because you want them to be coming back. Now, every six months, you want to get a serum creatinine on all patients. And the reason, the reason that you're getting a serum creatinine every three months for the patients with renal disease is you want to make sure that their renal disease is not progressing for any reason. The reason that you get a serum creatinine on everybody every six months is that you want to make sure that the tenofovir is not causing their kidneys to malfunction. So you will get a serum creatinine on all patients every six months. And then for those patients who have renal disease, you're going to get a urinalysis every six months, in addition to the serum creatinine you're giving every three months. And that's to look for anything in the urine that may be showing up, showing renal failure before the creatinine goes up, looking for proteinuria, glucosuria, etc. Those things would be consistent with, like, Fanconi's with phosphate in the urine and so forth. So just to recap, PrEP is an evidence-based preventative strategy to reduce the risk of HIV seroconversion. It is recommended in HIV-negative patients and HIV-negative patients alone in high-risk situations, especially including those in serodiscordant relationships, men who have sex with men and transgender women, IV drug users, and commercial sex workers. Obviously high-risk situation. It is contraindicated in patients who are HIV-positive and who have poor renal function, GFR less than 60 you need to test for this before you write the prescription for PrEP. You don't test for this and then write them a prescription for PrEP before you see the results. You've got to see these results. They're HIV negative, good kidney function, before you let them walk out with PrEP. 
PrEP is tenofovir and pracitabine. It requires strict daily adherence, and it takes one to three weeks to reach optimal levels, so make sure they're having safe sex before then, ideally always. Serious adverse effects include lactic acidosis, renal toxicity, hepatic dysfunction, and bone mineral density loss. You want to follow up at one month, three months, and every three months thereafter to monitor for adherence, screen for HIV, STDs, and renal issues. If you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you next time.